Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, and just uh, are amazed at your tremendous love for us. And Lord, we look forward to your return. We That is our, the blessed hope, your glorious appearing. And Lord, may no one um, distract us from that. May we keep our eyes focused upon you. And Lord, we pray this morning as we go through your word that you'd open up to our hearts and our lives. And as always, Lord, just uh, as we worship you, may it truly draw us close to you. And Lord, may you be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we're reading from Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my adversary will rejoice when I am shaken. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 as we continue our study through Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica. And over the last several weeks, we've been covering the first nine verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I think I could safely say those passages are not really too controversial. They're pretty straightforward. You know, Paul spoke of their labor of love and how they served the Lord faithfully. He spoke of the gospel power in their lives, and even though they were young Christians, their faith was seen by other word, others. In other words, they were living what they say they believed. And that same thought continued on as we saw their godly witness in their present life and the way they and where they came from, their past life. God did a mighty work in their lives, and even in the midst of persecution, this young church, they lived what they said they believed. Now, you knew it was bound to happen. I'm going to deal with a controversial subject this morning. In fact, I'm sure there'll be several controversial passages in this letter. And here, well, it's a subject that I think has been looked down upon lately and pretty much seen as not important, which to me is really strange when so much of the Bible contains this subject. What's the topic we're going to be looking at this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1? It's the return of Jesus Christ. Let me show you what I mean about some today who are downplaying prophecy. Uh, many of you know of Rick Warren and his book, The Purpose Driven Life. And this is what he says in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, to kind of give you an idea how he feels about prophecy. This is what he wrote in this quote. When the disciples wanted to talk about prophecy, Jesus quickly switched the conversation to evangelism. He wanted them to concentrate on their mission in the world. He said, in essence, the details of my return are none of your business. What is your business is the mission I have given you. Focus on that. Now, you, you read that thing, well, that sounds pretty good. It makes sense, but it's not biblical. That's the problem. Think about it. Jesus held the Jewish people responsible, why? For not knowing the day of his visitation the first time he had come. And the Lord has given to us over 500 prophecies related to his second coming. Do you think he wants us to know? The signs of the times? Absolutely he does. He wants us to be watching. Well, what is, where is Rick Warren getting that from? Well, he gets it out of Acts chapter 1, verse 7. He's quoting. And he, Jesus, said to them after his death and resurrection, he said, it's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Well, it sounds like he's right. It sounds like Rick Warren is correct in what he said. Remember what I've told you. Context, context, context. Read what's before. Read what's after. Get the flow because you can make a verse say whatever you want it to say if you, you know, put the bright lights under it enough and can make it talk. Listen carefully. This is a question that the disciples of Jesus asked him because the response of Jesus is born out of their question. Acts 1 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 
They're thinking kingdom age. That's their focus. Jesus says, are you going to establish the kingdom now? And Jesus says, it's not time yet. He wanted them to focus on the upcoming, their upcoming role in spreading the gospel. His very next comment in Acts 1 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Is what? It's the empowerment to bring the gospel message forward. And that's really the whole book of Acts. Work on building the church, but not ignoring the return of Jesus. We are still called to build the church to bring the gospel message forward forward, but why do we negate the return of Jesus Christ? Why do we think we spend too much time on this glorious truth? It's our hope. And so to ignore it, what do you do? You're taking away hope. And I'll talk, talk more about that in a few minutes, but let me share with you a few more who downplay this idea of prophecy in the Lord's return. Tony Campolo says, he's merging church, doesn't believe in the resurrection, doesn't believe in blood atonement. He says that Christians who make a big thing of their claim that we are now living in the final stage of church history prior to the second coming of Christ have been the cause of extremely detrimental consequences. They discount the Sermon on the Mount. They don't care about the needy and they have had such a negative impact on geopolitics, which Campolo says can lead only to war. Basically, according to Campolo, they are the reason the world is in such a mess and they are holding back progress of a more emerging spirituality. I think he's right to a point that we are holding back the progress of a more emerging spirituality. It's a false spirituality. It's a different Jesus. It's a different gospel. It's not one that doesn't believe in the blood atonement and the resurrection of Jesus. That's what we're fighting against. And he says that because we're waiting for the Lord's return, looking forward to the Lord's return, excited about the Lord's return, we're causing wars to break out. How has that happened? I, I, I guess I don't get it, but it, I guess if you say it, and you're a teacher, and you're teaching students at this Christian college, guess what? They're going to go and tell their congregations when they become pastors. The same garbage. We're called to be salt and light, and that's not bad for this world. It's good for this world. And I guess I should clarify that. It's bad for the world's system. It's horrible for the world's system. They don't want it. And this is what's best, you see. We're a preserving force. That's what we should be. Here's another one. This person wrote this. Listen carefully. It is time that the church woke up to its true mission, which is to materialize the kingdom of God on earth, today, here, and now. People are no longer interested in a possible heavenly state or a probable hell. They need to learn that the kingdom is here and must express itself on earth. The way into that kingdom is the way that Christ trod. It involves the sacrifice of the personal self for the good of the world and the service of humanity. Wow, doesn't that sound wonderful? Think about that. How good that is. This is what emerging church leader, what purpose-driven leader, what seeker-friendly leader is saying those words? Isn't that incredible? None of them. You know who said that years ago? The occultist Alice Bailey. What are we saying? The same words! Is that scary? That should shock you. That should make the hair in the back of your neck stand up and go, Wow! Who are we listening to? The Lord Jesus Christ and His Word? Or the devil? Because I'm sorry, Alice Bailey was following the devil. Incredible where the church has gone because we've moved away from God. And think about this. Is our hope in this world? No, absolutely not. What about our hope being in the leaders of this world? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think so. What about our hope being in our jobs, our financial earnings, our health, this or that? No. What's our hope? Titus 2.13 is our hope, guys. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our hope is in His return. And I realize many would argue that if you go down that path, if you believe that, and 
are teaching that, then people are going to sit around and wait for the Lord's return. That's the most ridiculous thing in the world. We're here to serve the Lord. You know, say my wife has gone away for a few weeks and it's getting close for her return. And knowing that and reading her letters or emails or whatever she sends me, I know the date of her return is getting closer. Does that cause me to sit in a lazy boy chair and wait for her to come home to clean the house and get things in order? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. i got to get this place looking good. It causes me also to be excited that she's coming home. What in the world does that have to do with what we've been talking about here? Turn over to 1 John chapter 2. I know, we'll get to, don't worry, we'll get to 1 Thessalonians. If you've gone to Revelation, move to the left a little bit. But 1 John chapter 2, we're going to start reading in verse 28, where John said this. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Jump down to chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You know, we know the Lord's coming back. That's exciting, and we're waiting for it. We shouldn't be ashamed. And thus, what we're doing are things that would honor him when he returns. Everyone who has this hope, the hope in what? The return of Jesus, purifies himself. We do things that are right. It helps us to walk accordingly. And like I said, we're to continue doing the work the Lord has called us to do. And Jesus said in Luke 19, 13, Occupy until I come. Continue doing the work until I come. Now, one more point here before we get to our verse that we'll be looking at this morning, and we will get there. It's, I realize it's only one verse, but it's powerful. But keep in mind that as young as this church was, they knew about how they were to live their Christian faith. They knew of eschatology or end times. They knew of the return of the Lord. They were waiting for him. That's incredible. Every chapter of Paul's letter to this church deals with the return of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, we see that they're waiting for his return to be delivered from the wrath of God that's coming. His imminent return. 1 Thessalonians 2.19, we see the unity of all believers at his coming. 1 Thessalonians 3.13, we see Paul speak of the sanctification process as they were being prepared for his return. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, we see the focus on the rapture of the church, another very, very controversial subject we'll deal with more in depth when we get to that. And the reason the rapture is so controversial is because people hold on to tradition. They listen to what others are saying instead of just reading God's word, taking it literally where it speaks literally, and then believing what God is saying. And again, we'll deal more with that when we get to that chapter. And lastly, in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, we see that they are prepared for his return. So every chapter of this letter to the Thessalonians deals with the Lord's return. And it was important to them. Shouldn't it be important to us? Absolutely. Roger Oakland put it like this, kind of this lackadaisical attitude today of Christians regarding the Lord's return. He said, many who were once looking for the return of Jesus have fallen asleep. We now live in a period of time where numer numerous prominent Christian leaders are telling the Christian masses that paying attention to the signs of our times in light of the Bible is a waste of time. And many of them take a, a step further and accuse those who believe what Bible prophecy says about the end of the age of being negative and self-centered. No, guys, it's not a waste of time. Not at all. God has told us these things to encourage us, uh, encourage us and to be witnesses of him. And I shared these verses before with you, but I think Isaiah 44, verses 6 to 8, really give us the reason why God tells us ahead of time the things that are going to take place. 
we're told, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me, since I have pointed the ancient people. And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there, are no, there is no other rock. I know not one. How important is it to understand prophecy? Well, the Lord says one of the reasons is you don't have to be afraid. Why? Because we know what's going to happen. You don't have to worry. We know the events that are going to take place. We know that the days are going to get more evil, more wicked. It doesn't stop us from being light. It doesn't stop us from being salt, but we're aware of it. And the second point is it's not just for us. It's to witness to others. How could you not be going crazy? Look at the events that are going on in this world today. Well, you know what? Jesus already told me these things are going to take place. Steve sent me an article this past week. Over 60% of the people in the world are for a global government. You know what? That's exactly what the Bible says is going to happen. We've already exceeded the halfway mark. Over 60%. And you think if there is some cataclysmic event, some major terrorist attack, that those numbers will even climb higher? Look at the one world religion. We're all coming together into one. Well, we're all not, but there is a big majority that are. So we can tell others, look, this is just what the Bible said is going to happen. We know this. We're being set up for a world leader who's called the Antichrist to lead the nations of this world. And we're primed for that. So prophecy is important. Spurgeon said, oh, this is a high mark of grace when the Christian expects his Lord to come and lives like one that expects him every moment. If you and I knew tonight that the Lord would come before this service was over, in what state of heart should we sit in these pews? In the state of heart we ought to be. Wow. Being ready for his return. Being excited for his return. I'm not ashamed to teach on this. I love teaching this because I'm excited. Besides creation being at the forefront of my salvation, it was prophecy also. In fact, probably for several years I taught at Calvary Chapel in Elk Grove um, as an assistant pastor. Every message I gave was on prophecy. And when I came up here, the Lord said, you know, there's more to my book than prophecy. You know, i got 66 books here, uh, lots of stuff. So, yeah, I, but when we come to it, we need to talk about it. So our message this morning is hope in his return. Oh, I can't wait. His imminent return. And so let's pick up. Well, we'll pick up. We're just going to read one verse. But uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And to, this is to the Thessalonian believers to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. These young Christians, who are they waiting for? Jesus Christ. They're excited. He's coming back. And where is he coming from? Heaven. To receive them. And like I said, Paul will deal more with this, with the rapture and the imminent return of Christ when we get to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, as Jesus is taken up into heaven after his death and resurrection, spending 40 days on the earth before he's taken up, this is what we're told. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward, toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. In other words, as Arnold used to say, I'll be back, right? He's coming back. And, you know, to say that Jesus told his men, don't bother with prophecy, it's not important for you to know, just go out and evangelize, is wrong. Why? Because here these angels are saying, you know, he's taken up, he's coming back. Keep looking. I like that. 
And when he comes back, he's going to establish his kingdom. But prior to the establishing of his kingdom, he's coming back to meet us in the air, as Paul says in chapter 4, to take his bride, his church, home to, to be with him. We'll meet him in the air. And then Christ will pour out his wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world. It's called the tribulation period, seven years. Many Jews come to Jesus during that time. Many Gentiles come to Jesus during the tribulation period. And as it draws to the end, after those seven years, the Lord returns with his bride, the church, to establish his kingdom on the earth where he will rule and reign for a thousand years. Praise God, man. Now, what is Jesus going to deliver them and us from? Here in 110, from the wrath to come. What is it speaking of? I think it's speaking of the tribulation period. What other wrath of God is being poured out? That's seven years of it. So that means we're going to be taken out before this begins, absolutely. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 9 through 11. Paul makes it very clear. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as all you are also doing. Now, again, in chapter 4, Paul speaks of the rapture of the church. Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he's speaking of the day of the Lord, of the tribulation period. So these verses, this, uh, in these verses, we see that the wrath that Paul is speaking of is the wrath of God being poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world during the tribulation period. And Paul's saying, we are not part of that period of time. God is going to deliver us from the wrath that is to come. We're going to be removed before that period starts. And I realize people say, oh, what are you talking about? There's all kinds of persecution. Christians are being killed today. Where is that persecution coming from? Not from God. But when the tribulation period starts, it's going to be the wrath of God that's poured out. And why would God pour out his wrath upon his bride? It makes no sense. And think about this. The wrath of God has been poured out upon Jesus as he bore our sins on the cross of Calvary. He took what was due us, right? Why would God punish us twice? You see, it was already paid for in full by Jesus. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. The work is completed. Why would he pour his wrath out on us again? That means the work that Jesus did either wasn't finished or wasn't accepted. But Jesus sat down because the work was finished. Now for those who reject Jesus, yeah, they'll see his wrath, either during the tribulation period if they're around at that time, or in hell waiting for the final judgment, the great white throne judgment, where the unsaved will be cast into the lake of fire for eternity. Now, here's the thing I want to focus on with our rest of our time this morning is on the imminency of the rapture of the church or the return of Jesus. In other words, that it could happen at any moment. The early church believed it. Paul believed it. But we tend to lose sight of that today. One writer put it like this in regards to this word, imminency. So the primary thought expressed by imminency is that something important is likely to happen and could do so without delay. While it may not be immediate nor necessarily soon, it is next on the program and may take place at any time. If the event is evil or potentially dangerous, we would call it impending, for it is threatening to occur. But if, an event, but if it is an event full of hope and joyful expectation, we express it by the noun imminence or the adjective imminent among believers. These words normally re relate to the possible soon coming of the, our Lord Jesus Christ to catch up his church in that happy and monumental event called the rapture. Here's the thing. You know, for me, I believe the Lord can come at any moment. Before we're done here this morning, I think he can come. Is it going to happen? I don't know. Could it be a year down the road? Five years? Ten years? Fifteen? Twenty? Fifty? It could. I don't know. But I know it could happen at any moment. And I'm excited about that. But there are those who try to deny this imminency of the rapture of the church. One webpage which denies the imminency and the rapture of the church went as far as saying 
this regarding the rapture and imminent return of Christ. Listen carefully, because we'll deal more with this when we get to uh, chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. It said, Rapture doctrine did not exist before John Darby invented it in 1830 A.D. Before it pop popped up into John Darby's head, no one had ever heard a secret rapture doctrine. The fact that John Nelson Darby invented the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine around 1830 A.D. is unquestionably true. All attempts to find evidence of this wild doctrine before 1830 have failed, with a single exception. Morgan Edwards wrote a short essay as a college paper for Bristol Baptist College in Bristol, England in 1744, where he confused the second coming with the first resurrection of Revelation 20 and described the pre-tribulation rapture. However, Edwards' ideas, which he admitted were brand new and never before taught, had no influence in the modern population of the false doctrine. The prize goes to Darby. Prior to 1830, no church taught it in their creed, catechism, or statement of faith. Now, those are pretty bold statements that the rapture of the church was not even heard of until 1830 when John Darby invented it. And if that were true, I guess I'd have to admit, well, yeah, it sounds like this is a recent uh, um, teaching, and maybe it's wrong. Is there any evidence to disprove what this man is saying? Well, first of all, we need to look at this idea that this was never taught before 1830 A.D. That's totally false. I'll, I'll show you what I mean in regards to the early church fathers teaching the doctrine of the rapture and imminent return of Christ, and they really go hand in hand, okay? First of all, the pseudo-Ephraim uh, document, somewhere between 374 and 627 A.D., all the saints and elect of God are gathered together before the tribulation, which is to come, and are taken to the Lord in order that they may not see at any time the confusion which overwhelms the world because of our sins. Huh. That sounds pretty much like the rapture, doesn't it? Pre-tribulation, before the tribulation period starts. I think it was a few years before 1830. And John Darby. Absolutely. The early church was looking for the return of Christ. It was imminent. The church was to be removed the rapture before the tribulation period started. Now, let me also say this. We all have ideas. We have traditions that we hold on to. But this is important. If your doctrine or tradition is not scriptural, you need to let it go. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes, but what I want to do right now is kind of look at these early church writings and what the people believed in the imminent return of Christ. And again, this is really related to the rapture of the church because they thought that he was coming back for the, his saints. Uh, the first epistle of Clement, written around 96 AD. And Clement was a prominent leader of the church in Rome who knew some of the apostles personally. He's probably the Clement referred to in Philippians 4.3. And this is what he wrote. Of a truth, soon and suddenly shall his will be accomplished, as the scriptures also bear witness, saying, Speedily will he come and will not tarry. What is he talking about? He's talking about the return of Jesus. The imminent return before 100 A.D. That's what the early church believed. Some 1,730 years before Darby was even around. Again, what is the evidence? Not tradition. That's important. Also, as early as 70 to 180 AD, the Didache, chapter 16, section 1 says, Be vigilant over your life. Let your lamps not be extinguished or your loins ungirded, but be prepared for you know not the hour in which our Lord will come. Again, come for who? The church. Be ready. He's coming. Imminent return. That's what they're speaking of. Lastly, Tertullian, in 155 to 245 AD, he wrote, But what a spectacle is that fast, approaching advent of our Lord, now owned by all, now highly exalted, now a triumphant one. And the imminent return of Christ. And it wasn't John Darby who brought this to the forefront. This is what the scriptures taught. Now, here, let me put a disclaimer here, because this is important. Just because the early church believed something, taught something, did something, does not mean it's biblical. 
It does not mean it's scriptural. Just because they did it doesn't make it right. I'll give you an example because uh, ancient practices t are being brought into the church today, and they're not biblical. They're not at all. I'll give you one example, a contemplative prayer um, and the Desert Fathers. Practices of these Desert Fathers that have been brought into the church. Uh, Ray Youngin says this. One meditation scholar made this connection when he said, the meditation practices and rules for living of these earliest Christian monks bear strong similarity to those of their Hindu and Buddhist uh, uh, brethren several kingdoms to the east. The meditative techniques they adopted for finding their God suggest either a borrowing from the East or a spontaneous rediscovery. Interesting. Roger Oakland gives us a little more insight about contemplative prayer. He says, what is contemplative prayer? Here is how one promoter defined it. Contemplative prayer in its simplest form is prayer in which you still your thoughts. This puts you in a better state to be aware of God's presence and makes you better able to hear God's voice correcting, guiding, and directing you. Now please understand, when we're talking about contemplative prayer and being still before God, we're not talking about you know, reading his word and listening to him. We're talking about emptying your mind. Okay, I can't afford to do that. All right, There's too much gone already. But it's, it's meditation, okay? This is what we're talking about with contemplative prayer. Uh, Roger Oakland says, if that definition sounds beneficial to one's spiritual well-being, consider another explanation that provides an even clearer understanding. Its practitioners are trained to focus on an inner symbol that quiets the mind. When practitioners become skilled at this method of meditation, they undergo a deep trance state similar to auto-hypnosis. So you're getting into hypnosis now. In other words, you are opening yourself up to demonic forces. And it's making a huge comeback. It was first discovered by monks in the third century who isolated themselves in desert monasteries. But now we find them in evangelical churches because they're going back to these desert fathers. Brian Flynn in his book Running with the Wind gives us this background where it came from. Perhaps the desert fathers either came into contact with someone from the east or who shared these practices with them or maybe they stumbled across it themselves. Whatever its origin, this heretical practice, contemplative prayer, has entered our churches virtually unopposed. The first form of mono, monastism, which is practiced by the hermit, it's, it's a Greek word that means desert, the first hermit was St. Anthony, a revered Egyptian monk who moved away from society and into the desert around 270 A.D. Many followed St. Anthony's lifestyle and also became hermits. Nearly 80 years later, the first monastery was built. This brought the hermits together under one roof rather than each of them living alone in the desert. So this is what these guys were doing, these practices. Thomas Merton is really one of the founding fathers of contemplative prayer. They, he, his writings have impacted Christianity. Consider the following statement that reflects Merton's Buddhist and Hindu beliefs. Okay, listen to this. This is what he wrote. This is what Christians are following. It is a glorious destiny to be a member of the human race. Now I realize what we all are. If only they, people, could all see themselves as they really are. I suppose the big problem would be that we would fall down and worship each other. At the center of our being is a point of nothingness, which is untouched by sin and illusions, a point of pure truth, this little point is the pure glory of God in us. It is in everybody. So we're God. Thomas Merton believed that we're all gods. And he's brought these practices into the church and we're reading his books and implementing his techniques. We're not God. In fact, the Lord said you will die as men if you think you're gods. Absolutely. Richard Foster is one of Thomas Merton's disciples. Some of you may know Richard Foster. He's probably one of the most influential and well-known uh, of those considered to be evangelical Christians, and he is supportive of contemplative prayer. And he considers Merton his mentor. Now, consider this question. Why would someone who claims to be a Christian, after reading and understanding Merton's position on Eastern religion, why would they promote his ideas? 
And worse yet, why is it that when other Christians who have embraced contemplative prayer are informed about this connection to Eastern religion, they refuse to listen? Haven't you found that a problem? Someone is into something that is not of God, and you start sharing with them, well, look, this is, goes against what the Scriptures say, and they look at you, they get upset with you. Well, why? The Word of God says that's wrong. Well, God could use anything. Yeah, good, good, good idea. Go with that. I think his word is sufficient for us. Listen to this. Now, please pay attention to what Richard Foster says about his mentor, Thomas Merton. Listen. Thomas Merton has perhaps done more than any other 20th century figure to make the life of prayer widely known and understood. His interest in contemplation led him to investigate prayer forms in Eastern religions, Zen masters from Asia regarded him as the preeminent authority on their kind of prayer in the United States. So now we're bringing Zen into Christianity. We're bringing all these Eastern practices into Christianity. Why? Because we don't trust what God's Word has to say. It's not sufficient for us, and we bring these other ideas in. The practices of the Desert Fathers were unbiblical. So why are they being adopted into the church today in a positive way? Oh, because I get closer to God. No, you're not. I'm sorry. Let me share this with you. Because, and, and please, this happened 37 years ago. Okay? Just keep that in mind. 37 years ago, this happened. And yet, today, look at where we're at. The year was 1980. The man had oversight of more than 400 churches in his denomination. He had called and invited me to come to his office to get acquainted. And when I entered, he asked me to sit down and then said something peculiar. Excuse me while I find a witness. He returned a few minutes later with the secretary. He told her to have a seat and to start taking notes. I asked him why he needed a witness. Because I'm going to read you the riot act, he responded. And then he proceeded to do just that. I want you to get out of my churches and stay out of them. Well, why, I asked. Because I don't want any of my people hearing your message. But my message is right out of the Bible, I protest, that all I'm doing is preaching the soon return of Jesus. I know, he said, and that's the message I don't want my people to hear. I was dumbfounded. Don't you believe in the second coming? Not what you call the second coming, he replied. I believe the second coming occurs when a person accepts Jesus. He becomes alive in that person's heart. That's all there is to the second coming. And before I could reply, he added, and there's another reason I don't want you preaching to my people. You're a salvationist. He said, I've been called many names in my life, but never that one. What do you mean by that? I asked. You are one of those guys who believes a fellow can hear a sermon and come under conviction about sin, and that conviction will ultimately lead him to repent and experience what you call being born again. Got me. <laughs> I plead guilty, he said. What are you? Well, I'm not a salvationist, he snapped. I believe that any person in the world who is growing more mature is in the process of being saved. Does that apply to Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims, I asked. Yes, he said. Whether they ever accept Jesus or not, that's right. One of the most curious things about this whole experience is that on the wall behind this man's desk was a framed quotation that read, I speak where the Bible speaks, and I am silent where the Bible is silent. Welcome to the bizarre world of Christian apostasy. And keep in mind this happened in 1980. In the 37 years since that time, apostasy in the church has increased exponentially. I mean, look, where are the New Age bookstores? They're not around. All the books are in Christian bookstores. That's where they're selling, like hotcakes. Here's the thing that I want to bring out, though. Do you see the danger of following a man instead of following the Lord and his word? I hope so. False doctrine was part of the early church. Look at some of the letters that Paul wrote and John wrote, and you see them confronting the false teachers and the false doctrine that's out there. Jude had to do it. When you read the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor that Jesus wrote in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, four out of the seven have major doctrinal issues going on. That's in less than 70 years of the church being in existence. 
Well, what are we to do then? Bring everything in the light of Scripture. It's easy. This is our truth tester. You know, when it says that we're gods, when you read the Word of God, what does it say? There are no other gods but me. Okay, truth tester just told me that's a false teaching. You see, this isn't complicated. I'm not a brilliant guy. I just believe what the script. Don't laugh. I, mean, I, I understand. I just believe what the scriptures say, guys. I do. I just trust what they say. I, I, if I start going beyond that, that's where I get into trouble. And people may get offended by that. Why? When I shared the Word of God, you know, like I said, we had to take Pastor Frank Ippolito off the air because he was teaching about women being pastors. And in this letter that he sent to me, one of the things he said, well, you know, he said he listened to it and he didn't really mean it that way. And then he said, but there are a lot of churches in our community that uh, have women pastors and I don't want to offend them. Well, okay, you offended me now. Okay? Because you went against God's word. You're concerned about how people are going to feel. I'm more concerned how God thinks about what I'm doing, what I'm saying. I'm representing him. I'm accountable to him. So if you want me to water something down, then this probably is not going to be the church for you. I'm sorry. I'm not going to water the scriptures down to make people feel comfortable about living in sin. It's never going to happen. That's just me. And for the early church, they were always told to go back to the Word of God. And was it, were they waiting for the Lord? Yeah. 1 Corinthians 1 7, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. They're waiting eagerly. You go to some churches, well, we don't want to deal with. You know, the book of Revelation is really confusing and it just, it, it makes people upset and so we're not going to deal with prophecy. Well, you got to edit 25% of the scriptures or more if you're not going to deal with end times prophecy. I'm sorry, it's pretty important. 1 Corinthians 16, 22. O Lord, come. It's an Aramaic word, Maranatha. That's how they used to greet each other. How awesome, right? we're told the early church faced much persecution and life for a Christian under Roman rule was not easy. The Romans required everyone to declare that Caesar was God. And the early Christians knew that there is only one God and one Lord, Jesus Christ. And in all good conscience, they could not call Caesar Lord. So the Romans looked upon them as traitors, persecuted them, and put them to death. Living under those adverse conditions, the believer's morale was lifted by the hope of the coming of the Lord, Maranatha. That became a common greeting of the opposed, oppressed, excuse me, believers, replacing the Jewish greeting, shalom, or peace. The followers of Jesus knew there would be no peace because Jesus had told them so, but they also knew the Lord would be returning to set up his kingdom, and from that truth they drew great comfort. They were constantly reminding and being reminded that the Lord is coming. Jesus taught several parables on the same theme of watching and waiting and being prepared for his return. Today, believers in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ live our, live our lives in the light of the knowledge that he can come at any time. We are to be ready when, when the call comes. Every day we should expect him to come, and every day we should long for him to come. Maranatha reminds us to keep our eyes on the eternal things of the Spirit. To dwell on material things is to be in constant mental turmoil. Looking down, we see the earth. Looking around, we see earthly things. But looking up, we see the hope of the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. To those who are discouraged today, Maranatha. To those who are worried today, Maranatha. To those who are fit, filled with anxiety over the problems they are facing, Maranatha, our Lord is coming. I love the greeting. We should greet each other with that. Maranatha, O oh Lord, come, right? Now, I'm not saying that we put our lives on hold. The Lord's coming, why should I go do this? Why should I get a job? Why should I go to school? Paul had to address this issue. He said, man, you don't work, you don't eat. So you don't go waiting for the Lord doing nothing. You've got to be working. You, you live your life out, but you're always looking for his return. That's the exciting thing. In Philippians 3, verses 20 through 21, for our citizenship is in heaven, 
from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to even subdue all things to himself. What is he talking about? He's talking about the rapture. When do we get our new bodies? At the rapture. That's exciting. Don't lose sight. He's coming back. And you could look at and turn over to 1 Thessalonians 4. Look at verses 15 through 18. And listen to what Paul says here. He says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep or who are de have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Do you see that? We're, when the Lord comes in a second coming, where is he coming to? The earth, to set up his kingdom. In the rapture of the church, where does he meet us? In the air. It's different. It's not the same, guys. And Paul's encouraging these believers that those who have died in Christ did not miss on, out on the rapture. They're going to be raised first. As the Lord calls us home, we're going to be caught up with them. What a wonderful day. And a verse that we've covered, Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are they waiting for the Antichrist? No. They're waiting for Jesus Christ. He's our hope. His appearing. That's what we're looking for. Don't lose sight of that. Don't be discouraged. In James 5, verses 7 through 9, James says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until he receives the early and latter rain? You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble, grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. James is saying, man, be ready. The Lord's coming back. You know, wait for him. But he is coming. Don't lose hope. It's getting close. I like the way Zane Hodges illustrates this. He says, the readers are thereby likened, likened to a group of litigants of de or defendants standing within a courtroom. Total silence is required out of respect for the judge who is just outside the courtroom door and about to step inside and take his place on the judgment seat. Like a Roman lector announcing a judge's impending entry, as it were, James cries, quiet. His Christian readers must fully silence their complaints against one another in the realization that their Lord and judge can at any moment appear and sit down on the bema seat or the judgment seat in order to assess their lives. I like that. That's what we're waiting for. And I love, I'll give you one more, Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. What a wonderful invitation from Almighty God to come to him and receive the gift of life that's found in Jesus Christ. You know, how important it is to realize we're sinners separated from God. We cannot do anything about that problem. We can't bridge the great gap between man and God. The God-man, Jesus Christ, bridged that gap for us by dying on the cross of Calvary. And, man, Lord, soften the hearts of people here today that may not know you or who are listening on the radio, the internet, the television, that they can receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior to repent of their sins. And I love Revelation 22, 20. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Oh, you got to love John. I'm coming quickly, John. Oh, Lord, come quickly. Come on. You know, and that's kind of us. Glorious appearing. I, I, I mean, I'm looking for Jesus. It doesn't stop me from focusing on the work that I'm to do. It doesn't take my eyes off of the lost it actually encourages me more because I know the time is short. Who's that last Gentile that's going to get saved? And then the Lord calls us home. I don't know. If it's one of you, hurry up and get saved so we can go home. 
<laughs> but how important it is to keep our eyes focused. The early church was looking for the blessed hope of the return of Jesus. And I don't want to take that hope away from you. So as we go through these passages that deal with his return, I, I'm going to deal with them. I'm going to share with you what, what the scriptures say. In fact, the whole book of Revelation, we think, oh, the book of Revelation, it's all the judgments of God. It's, you know, the revealing of the Antichrist. No, that's not what the book of Revelation is. It's the revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Think of this beautiful statue that's been carved, and it's got a cover over it. And now here's the day it's going to be unveiled. And that's what the book of Revelation is all about, the unveiling of Jesus Christ for everyone to see him when he returns in glory. As lightning flashes across the sky, every eye will see him. As I begin to close, let me share this with you. We're told living the Christian life can be likened to driving a car. As we drive on the highway, we keep two viewpoints in balance, looking ahead at the upcoming road and looking behind through the rearview mirror. As we move toward heaven, we also need to maintain a balance between two biblical viewpoints looking for the blessed return of Christ that will bring eternal glorification and reward, and looking back to the atoning death of Jesus that provided everything we have received in redemption, our experiencing in sanctification, and will receive an inheritance reserved for us in heaven. The Bible provides many motivations for us to grow in Christ and persevere in our spiritual walk. Many of them are directly connected to the imminent return of Christ for the church. In Titus 2.12, Paul said, The grace of God teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age as we look for the blessed hope of the return of Christ. In John, 1 John 2.28, John urged us to abide in Christ, living expectant lives of fellowship and obedience so that when Christ returns, we'll have confidence and not want to shrink away in shame. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul asked God himself to sanctify us and preserve our souls, spirit, and body, body blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The biblical passages that promise the rapture of the church teach imminence as an event that occur, can occur at any moment. In these passages, there are no events or signs that must precede the rapture. They either encourage believers to continue to look forward to the hope that awaits them, or they motivate believers to pursue holiness in anticipation of seeing Christ soon. And until the rapture, believers are to look not for some sign, but for the Lord himself. What is your hope for the future? It's something you're going to have to decide. I pray it's the Lord and his return, that we're excited about that. And I'll tell you, that excitement just should bubble up inside of us and flow outwardly to minister to other Christians, to encourage them, and to under, unbelievers to draw them to Christ. People in this world know something's happening. You can't tell me, when you look at our nation and you see the things that are going on, that it doesn't trouble you a little bit. I mean, we see the intolerance, the hostility, the anger, the words that are being said. You know, if you don't agree with me, God bless you, man. I'm not going to argue with you. But today... We are so intolerant of people, aren't we? I look at these, these speeches that are given at graduation by professors and these other people, and they're all hateful speeches. I'm not sure if I'm graduating and getting out into the world that my encouragement speech should be, Donald Trump is a racist, pit, bigot, uh, whatever. How does that encourage me to go out into the world? It doesn't. But here's the thing, and I hope you take this with you. I hope I've encouraged you that the Lord is coming back. Be excited, be ready, and be open to what the Lord is showing you. May we greet each other with those words, Maranatha, O oh Lord, come, right? Because he's coming back. And I tell you, you know, someone says to me, Maranatha, I'm like, oh yeah. It just refocuses you, doesn't it? Okay, the Lord is coming back. It changes everything. This is temporary. That's eternal. And I look at a world of people that don't know the Lord. I pray for them.
Now we've got uh, parades all over the place tomorrow. And I pray for those Christians that are out there sharing the gospel, handing out tracts, witnessing, that God would soften the hearts of the people and they've come to saving faith because that's their only hope. It's our hope. The blessed return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Maranatha, guys. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. What an encouragement it is, Lord, to know that you're coming back. Will it be in my lifetime? I don't know. I think so. I live every day like it is, and I'm excited. And if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, to be absent from the body is to be present with you. I don't lose anything. But boy, I hope I sure have encouraged some Christian friends to continue on in the faith. I hope I have shined a light to those that don't know you, that they would come to saving faith. I think that's our heart's prayer, Lord. We know you're coming back. That's not going to, nothing's going to stop that. But Lord, there's a lot of people that don't know you. And we shouldn't be fearful, worried, anxious. You've told us what's going to happen. Now may we be a witness to those that don't know you. Thank you, Lord, for being our God. And help us to live a life that is pleasing to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.